that we should be looking at with this investigation and special counsel that is our request here, it goes a long ways back. It goes clear back to Huma Abedin, Anthony Weiner, 650,000 emails, which we still have access to. And the question that was answered to us by James Comey, which is, there was nothing to see there. We did a fast software search of 650,000 emails, and in the case of Huma Abedin and Anthony Weiner sharing laptop and sharing emails, there was nothing new in 650,000 emails. And what we've done in this Congress so far is just taken his word for that. Now, it seemed fairly logical to take his word at the time until you examine the investigation that he conducted of Hillary Clinton. Oh, by the way, it was a matter. The investigation that had Cheryl Mills, her chief of staff, as her chief counsel in the room with Hillary Clinton, and both of them had a plea bargain of some kind. They were exempted from prosecution for some by, by limited terms, but in any case, when you have this chief of staff who's a subject of investigation too, there as counsel to the person who is the subject of the investigation, and we ask under oath, and I ask these questions of Comey, or, or of Loretta Lynch and Comey under oath, and that is, where's the copy of the transcript? Where's the, where's the audio files? Where's the video files? Who was in the room? We don't have the answers to any of that except no. There was no, there were no, if there were notes taken, we don't know who they are or where they are. If there was any transcript, of, of the deposition, then that doesn't exist either, neither do the tapes of either audio or video. This is what looks like on its face is a sham investigation, plus they destroyed a tremendous amount of information, at least 30,000 emails, crushed hard drives, bought bleach bit, hired outside contractors to scrub the emails up, and were to take James Comey's word for this, that there wasn't enough substance there to bring a prosecution, even though on a year ago, July 5th, James Comey delivered 15 minutes of the summary of a prosecution that was completely convincing to me until they got down to the last couple of sentences of that presentation, which is, well, we can't prove intent. Well, curiously, there's no requirement for intent in the two statutes that appear to have been violated. And furthermore, I look back in the records to the previous October and the previous April, Barack Obama stated into the, into the, the, the news media record, he said Hillary Clinton would never intend to put our national security at risk. Hillary Clinton would never intend to harm America's security. That's October and April, the previous October and April. Well, James Comey latched on to that word intend and they made up new law and gave Hillary Clinton an exemption for this lack of intent that they said they couldn't prove, which is absolutely proven by the facts that he delivered to us in the summary that day and that there is evidence for. And I would go on. And not only does this trail lead through Hillary Clinton and James Comey, but the Loretta Lynch component of this as well. When you put this in place and you look at the example of them on the tarmac, it's hard to imagine they sat there for 38 minutes and discussed grandchildren. I think that might even be singular grandchild at the time. We should check that. Uh, but the, the answers that we got from Loretta Lynch were far less than satisfying. And then that brings me to Alexandra Chalupa, who went off as, a, she was a DNC contractor that went off over to Ukraine to try to gather dirt on the, on the Trump people. So bringing this around, Mr. Chairman, I'll conclude it with this as my time will soon run out, and that is this, that the trail leads, I believe, also to Barack Obama. We need to investigate all of this. And uh, I'm curious as to what you think the limited powers of the president might be, uh, given you grant him such latitude to amend Obamacare, extend the statutory deadline because it conforms with the broader intent of the law, and your reference to the intent of Congress that they really intended to allow for uh, the application of taxes and the, the distribution of refundable tax credits, even though Mr. Cannon testifies that that's not in the section that applies. So from a broader perspective, could you tell me how you think the president's powers are limited and I maybe just ask, does he have the power to lay and collect taxes? Well, first of all, I, I think that the president's powers are limited by what the statute provides. Um, and I, I, I think I've, I've said several times, I agree entirely, that um, the president cannot simply refuse to uh, uh, apply or enforce a law for policy reasons. But can he, On the can other he regulate hand, commerce, can, for example? The president is obligated to phase in uh, a new law I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Lett, I hear that, but, but I'm trying to get to the constitutional limitations that you think the president has. Now, let me just bypass the enumerated powers with the exception of 
what would happen? I'm concerned about Mr. Turley's statement that we get into a, a, a pretty dangerous area here if we don't have constitutional limitations. What if we just leap to the end of this thing? Is What if the president declared war? What if he assumed that authority? What is the recourse then? What would your counsel be to this Congress if we objected to such a thing? Or even if we objected to it on purely constitutional grounds and we thought it was a good policy decision and he vetoed our resolution to declare war? That should get us to the bottom of this discussion. Well, the president doesn't have the authority under the Constitution to Correct. declare war. Uh, the Congress does. The Congress has not been enormously eager to exercise that authority in, in my lifetime. Um, but uh, that's a very complicated subject, and it's the subject of well, thank you, Mr. Lazarus, interplay but between Congress and, and, uh, uh, and the executive branch. There is a War, war Powers Act. There are disputes about... How Let me then pick it up from there, that, that I'm illustrating this point that if there's an incremental march down through as a president overreaching his constitutional authority, in my opinion, I think the opinion of many people on this committee in this room, uh, he could assume among that any of the enumerated powers and the recourse that Congress would have all the way down to the declaration of war and the recourse that Congress would have would be pass a resolution of disapproval or we could shut off the funding through the power of the purse and the president's already assumed the power of the purse and so the next recourse is go to the courts and if we find out that uh, the courts do not grant standing for members of Congress then the next recourse is I think as Mr. Rosencrantz said the word that we don't like to say in this committee, and I'm not about to utter here in this particular hearing, uh, the balance I want to come to is ask Mr. Cannon this question. The frustration of this balance of powers because of the disrespect for the various branches, the, other, the competing branches of government that come, and I'll argue that the Founding Fathers envisioned that each branch of government would jealously protect its po constitutional power and authority, and that static balance that would be there would be the definition of a brighter line between the three articles of the Constitution. But what's your suggestion on how, what, what then finally resolves this? I know we said elections. If the elections um, are affected by decisions of the executive branch, what do the people do who are the final arbiters of this definition of the Constitution if they're even frustrated by the election? Me or to, or to I'm asking Mr. Cannon, please. I think it was to me. And you're, you're asking if, if there's no judicial remedy and there's no electoral remedy, what do the people do? Uh, mm -hmm. to, to what particular sort of abuses are you? Any one of the list of the enumerated powers, for example, ending with the declaration of war, because that's the starkest of all. There is a procedure in the Constitution that it allows uh, the people to amend the Constitution without going through Congress. Uh, that is that that is another um, uh, another method uh, where the people can try to restrain the executive. May suggest then, if that should happen, why would a why would an executive with such disrespect for the Constitution today honor an amended Constitution from a constitutional convention? That is an excellent question. I think I'd like to turn to Mr. Turley and ask him if he's had a chance to reflect upon that earlier statement of the situation that we are in, um, and where this goes. I mean, we need to look into this future and I'd ask that unanimous consent for that additional minute to ask each of the witnesses to tell us what's America look like in the next 25 years if we have executive upon executive that builds upon this this continual stretching or disregard of the constitutional restraints and the disrespect for Article 1. I start with Mr. Turley. And you may answer the question as quickly as you can. Okay. Uh, I, I I really uh, have great trepidation of where we are heading because we are creating uh, a new system here, something that is not well, what was designed. We have this rising fourth branch in a system that's tripartite. Uh, the center of gravity is shifting, and that makes it unstable. And within that system, you have the rise of an uber presidency. Uh, there could be no greater danger for individual liberty. And I, I really think that the, the framers would be horrified by that shift because everything they dedicated themselves to was creating this orbital balance, and we've lost it. Uh, as I've said before, I think the ultimate check is uh, elections, but uh, you know, I don't think you should be hesitant to speak the word in this room. A check on executive lawlessness is impeachment, and if you find that the president is willfully and repeatedly violating the Constitution if, on your hypothetical, he were to declare war, I would think that would be a clear case for impeachment. Well, I guess uh, this is the first time I've uh, 
heard anyone c complain about the poss possibility that uh, this president is going to uh, unilaterally declare war uh, and be over aggressive about that. I don't really think that's a uh, much of a uh, description of, of his uh, foreign policy. Um, but I, I, Congress has lots of power if it chooses to use it. The power of the purse is an enormous power. Um, and um, I, I think that, that uh, if, if I were you, I'd, I'd find ways to uh, influence policy and in using the Congress's powers, which you're not doing. I mean, for example, we're hearing complaints about uh, the, the President's actions to um, uh, not, uh, in, uh, not enforce uh, deportation against uh, certain classes of, of, uh, of, of immigrants. Um, you know, the, instead of complaining about that, this committee could hold a markup and, and report out a comprehensive immigration reform bill, send it to the floor. Mr. Lazarus, you are uh, not you, but the questioner is two and a half minutes I'm over. So if you can dispense with giving us advice on what our legislative agenda <laughs> should look like and answer the question, I'd be grateful to you. Okay. Well, uh, that, that, but that is an answer. I think that you know, Congress has a lot of power and it can use it. Okay. And I assume that the failure to exercise is also an exercise of power, the failure to act. Mr. Cannon, would you like well, to briefly maybe, answer? Maybe Mr. Lazarus knows better than I do how many bombs the, the president has to drop without congressional authorization before that becomes war. Uh, I don't know the actual number. Uh, but I think what Mr. King was getting at is, you know, there is, there is one last uh, res, uh, res, uh, thing to which the people can resort if the government does not uh, respect the uh, the the restraints that the Constitution places on the government. Abraham Lincoln talked about our, our right to uh, alter our government or our revolutionary right to overthrow it. And that is certainly something that no one wants to contemplate. But uh, as I mentioned in my, in my, in my written uh, and my delivered testimony, if the people come to believe that the government is no longer constrained by the laws, then they will conclude that neither are they. That is why this is a very, very dangerous sort of thing for the, uh, the, the president to do, to wantonly ignore the laws, uh, to try to impose obligations on people that the legislature did not approve. An excellent conclusion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back.